Welcome, everyone. Um, hope you're having a good day so far. Thank you for joining us. We're really excited about this webinar. We've, of course, brought Lauren Williams again to talk about financial advising. We're going to kind of touch on taxes uh, in this webinar, so super excited about that. But before we kind of dive right into it, I want to kind of give a proper introduction of Lauren. Um, many of you may know her, but if you don't, I wanted to give just some background on her real quick. Uh, Lauren Williams is an American track and field sprinter and bobsled athlete. She's the first American woman in history to medal in both summer and winter Olympic Games. Uh, Lauren's a four-time Olympian, dynamic speaker, and certified financial planner who owns her own business, Worth Winning. Check her out at worthwinning.com. Uh, Lauren's an expert when it comes to working with athletes who holds an MBA and credentials as a certified financial planner, college funding and student loan advisor, and as an accredited financial counselor. We're so happy to have her with us here today. Please welcome Lauren Williams again. And uh, Lauren, please take it away. <laughs> Well, thank you for having me, Team Parity, and everyone, thanks for showing up. Um, I hope to provide value to you all today. Um, I am glad we're getting a second go-round of this one. There was uh, a previous attempt at this one, but we, we didn't get it quite as planned because we had all kinds of technical difficulties. So Charlotte and I were about 15 minutes early today just to make sure <laughs> no problems and we're ready to rock and roll. So <laughs> let's get the party started. Uh oh, come on, chair. There we go. All right. So today we're talking um, tax FAQ. So as female athletes, we um, frequently end up in situations where uh, we have to figure out taxes on our own. So the majority of us are not employees of companies where we're receiving a pretty steady paycheck um, but as athletes we're getting you know as elite athletes we're getting income from all sorts of places and it comes in all sorts of different forms and fashion so we wanted to take some time today to talk about what it looks like to kind of fall into the various tax buckets and what you should be thinking about to be best prepared for taxes um, as an athlete so Cheryl's already done all of the who am I <laughs> you don't need to do this part again um, and so we're just going to kind of cover like various things that come up as the FAQs all the time. So we'll start with sole proprietor versus independent contractor. And so this is one of those things where people are like tomato, tomato, or are they really different? Like, how are they different? What, what does it all actually mean? Um, and there's also kind of self-employed that people throw in the mix when we're thinking of this. So let's start with sole proprietor. Sole proprietor simply means that you are earning money doing something. So sole, you know, mean only. It's like you're the only person of this business. Um, and so like to think of examples, let's say Etsy is super popular nowadays. And let's say you decide to sell face masks on Etsy. Well, selling those face masks on Etsy, on Etsy, you know, you can today decide you want to do that and just immediately start doing it, set up an Etsy account or, you know, even start doing it from your own Instagram account. You know, there's all sorts of different ways that people are earning income now and, you know, picking up side hustles and trying to figure out things. And you don't need to set up a business and get a lawyer and do all those things. Like You can just start making money. That's what a sole proprietor is, is you're doing something, you as the one person, you didn't set up a specific business entity and you're doing that to earn some sort of income from the outside world. Um, now, in comparison, the independent contractor is uh, a person who is providing a service to someone else uh, as, a, as part of their business. So as an example, you know, today I'm, you know, providing a service to Parity, uh, but I'm not an employee of Parity. So independent contractor being that you are providing some sort of service on an independent basis, uh, but you are, like I said, once again, trying to earn an income from that. So you, ha you have a kind of contract or an agreement between two people or two companies um, to do some work and you know, you know, you're one person, so you're an independent contractor. Um, now, kind of like, what's the difference? Are they both like, are, are they similar, same or not? Um, like I said, one is a, usually a product, generally, when you think of sole proprietorship, but you can also do a service. An independent contractor, like I said, is someone that is doing something for an agreement of service. They're both, however, self-employed. Um, so an independent contractor is one person, whereas a sole proprietor is a different kind of person. The, the kind of umbrella term is self-employed. And so it's like, is that yet another kind of tax term or is that something else? Like, what is it? And it's just kind of a general way to refer to various people. Um, you know, you do business for yourself. So that's kind of the difference between the sole proprietor and independent contractor. Um, 
then we have the like, well, what if I do want to become a business or when should I become a business? A lot of people are talking about setting up LLCs and they feel like, you know, maybe because they're not sure about the difference between the, the two, um, the sole proprietor, and independent contractor and realizing that it's not necessary for either of those to set up a business. You can simply just start to run your business. Um, you know, they, they hear something from a friend and they feel like I need to be a business. So what is it? An LLC is a limited liability company. Limited liability, meaning that exactly what it says. It, it's limiting your liability. So what you would do if you set up an LLC is go to, you know, your state organization, um, fill out some paperwork and decide you wanted to be um, worth winning LLC. <laughs> so in that case, now you are a company and I'm not just Lauren the person. I'm not just an independent contractor. I am now operating as Lauren Williams LLC. What does that do for me? It limits my liability. Uh, so if someone wanted to come after me because, you know, I gave bad information on the webinar, they would be coming after worth winning LLC versus coming after Lauren Williams, the person and suing, suing me for my personal assets. Um, so there's the benefit for that. Um, when you think about like, do I need this or not? You know, what kind of liability might you have in the business that you're running? And if there is some sort of big liability, then maybe you do want to have an LLC and get things set up so that you have a separate account for business, a separate account for, um, you know, your personal expenses. And that's another good point. Sole proprietors generally are operating from one, one account. I always recommend that people open a separate account just to kind of separate things, keep life simple. Because how do you really know what you're spending on the, the face mask material versus the, the shipping and the Instagram ad you're running versus your regular monthly rent, bills, groceries, etc. cetera. Um, so as a sole proprietor, you can have two separate accounts, but you don't have to, and most people do not. With an LLC, however, you definitely want to set up a separate account and run your business expenses through it. Now, one of the things that people get confused about is like, well, I, you know, sometimes I, you know, I, I, I went out to the store and I had to pick up uh, <laughs> some sort of business expense and then I used my personal card. And now before you know it, it's mingled because I, I wasn't going to not buy it, even though I didn't have my business card with me. Yes, it, it can happen. You can do that. There's no like IRS police over your shoulder the minute that you make a mistake and, and purchase one thing from the next. Uh, but you need to be mindful because you also want to get the tax deductions associated with whatever are your business expenses. So LLC limits liability. It doesn't do anything other than that um, by itself. And so a, a lot of athletes I hear are setting up the LLCs because they hear, like I said, a friend has done it, but they don't realize that um, the, the reason that their friend has likely done it if they're working with an accountant or a financial planner is because they're also going to make an S election. And so an S election is a tax uh, status that can go with your LLC. So you're still worth winning LLC, but for tax purposes, you've elected to be um, looked at as an S corp, an S corp being a small corporation so that um, you know, you're, not, you're not governed by the big rules. So there's also C corps. C corps are like the bigger corporations. So like a Walmart, a, you know, um, P and G, you know, bigger companies are the, the C corps. The S corps are usually more appropriate for smaller businesses because um, they give you a little bit more flexibility. They're not as expensive to run and they're taxed differently. So C corps are taxed twice, whereas S corps are taxed more like um, self employed income is taxed. So the big benefit to doing the S corp is taking advantage of paying lower self employment tax. So that's why people set up the LLC. If you hear your friends talking about like, oh, I'm going to become, you know, I swim fast LLC, uh, it's because they are likely in uh, income bracket. They, and they may not be. They may, they may have just heard it from someone else. So they, they might not necessarily need to be doing this. But the, the, the reason you should be doing this is that you're earning enough money that you, one, need to limit your liability. But two, you'd like to make the S election so that you could pay a little bit less taxes. So how do you pay less taxes? Uh, we all play what is called self-employment income. Well, when you make the S election for um, tax purposes, what happens is some of that self-employment income now is not, you're not subject to. So you will be required to pay yourself a salary. So let's say you make $100,000 a year. With that $100,000 a year, um, you know, well, let's, we got to make the math around $120,000 a year. So you make, you make roughly $10,000 a month. Well, we know we need to pay Uncle Sam some of that money, but we're not sure exactly how much. 
So what does it make sense to do is like when money comes in, um, you know, to get a good little buffer going in our LLC or our S Corp and set aside, but then we start paying ourselves um, a monthly salary. So let's say we decide that, you know, I'm going to pay myself $6,000 a month. Uh, so now you look like an employee of a corporation in the same way as if you worked at a Starbucks or a, I don't know, Jimmy John's. I'm just making up places today. Um, but if you work at a Starbucks, you know, you are an employee of that place and then you get a, a paycheck. So now, even though you are the business owner, you've made yourself an employee. You one, stabilized your income, which is awesome because as athletes, what do we do? We have income that looks like this. <laughs> it's like, oh, it's the season. Oh, it's not the season. Oh, the season's over. There's three more months until right, something happens. <laughs> exactly. Um, so when we do this S Corp setup, we're one, required to pay ourselves like an employee, but two, it's a good thing because uh, we, we can stabilize our income. So in our example, we're now bringing home $6,000 a month, which means some of our money is still sitting in our LLC because we need to cover some of the business expenses, such as, you know, traveling for competition or, um, you know, like I said, if we're running a regular business office expenses, expenses or things like that. Um, but the, of the 6,000 that we're bringing home, all of that is not ours. So what's going to happen when you give yourself a real paycheck, uncle Sam's going to take some of it. Um, so same way that it would if you were at Starbucks, you would make an election for how much tax you want to have withheld. And now it's making your life simpler because instead of having to figure out like, oh my goodness, do I have enough, you know, estimated tax, I got to put some money aside. You now have a steady paycheck. You can make your budget off that steady paycheck and some money is already going to Uncle Sam. So you don't have to worry about, you know, him <laughs> beating down your door at the end of the day uh, when it comes time for tax season. Um, now, there is kind of the caveat that, like I said, let's say you have a, a sponsorship and the sponsorship is the thing that gave you that $120,000 of income. You also are probably going to have prize money coming in as you go to different competitions, races, meets, etc. cetera. Um, and so that's additional income. So you do want to set some money aside to be able to pay additional taxes on that money because that's not coming out of the, the money that's flowing to your account every month. So LLC, limits liability, S Corp is an election that you would put with a limited, a limited liability company to save yourself money on taxes. And the, the key thing is you need to pay yourself. So when we think about paying ourselves, you know, there's kind of two different ways that this kind of transpires as well. So many of us as athletes have received a W-9 when we, you, we have to fill out before we can actually get income from whatever it is that we're signing up for. So our NGB may um, ask us to fill out a W-9. If you're doing a speaking engagement, they may ask you to fill out a W-9. Um, and this is you providing your information to someone that is going to pay you so that they can say, hey, this was an expense to us. We don't want to pay taxes on money that was in our account. Um, we, we sent this money to someone else and it was their income and hey, IRS, you should go tax them on it. Um, and so that's where you would get at the end of the year, a 1099 form. So you fill out the W-9, my name is Lauren, is my social security number, um, you know, sign it. And at the end of the year, they'll say, I paid Lauren X number of dollars. And you know, now I need to pay taxes, turn that form in for my tax purposes. Um, now, things that are important about the W-9 and the 1099 is one, the W-9, uh, if you want to be a business entity, so if you're an LLC or, you know, LLC being taxed as an S-Corp, um, even if you're a sole proprietor or independent contractor, you can go out and get an EIN number, which is the equivalent of your social security number for um, business purposes. Like, so your business would have a social security number. That's what the EIN number is. The, the reason that I recommend doing that, like I said, for LLCs and S-Corps, you need to. Um, more optional if you're just operating as an independent contractor or a sole proprietor. But uh, the reason it's beneficial is because then you're not giving your social security number out all the time. So imagine if you had like, you know, a lot of little one-off gigs, you know, you did this parody event today, you did, you know, the fight for us financial literacy tomorrow and, you know, ABC um, speaking engagement on Thursday. You're now giving your social security number to three different companies, corporations, person, you know, and you want to get paid. So you, you need to turn in your W-9, but you don't know how big or small these companies are, who's behind the scenes running them, you know, what, what, what they would do with the financial information they're gathering besides actually, you know, some, give you your paycheck and submit that to the IRS. So an EIN number gives you an extra level of protection uh, should, you know, something, you know, go awry that would be tied to your 
uh, your business number, your EIN number, as opposed to your personal social security number and your you know, identity not be able to be stolen. So that's one good thing about it. The other thing is that we don't think about as athletes is that we should be filling out these or giving out these W-9s to people that we work with. So nutritionists, massage therapists, um, coaches, anybody that we're paying over $600 um, for the year should be getting this W-9 form, <laughs> filling it out. Yes, yep. Lauren's like, I see, yep, this is something we need to do. And at the end of the year, they should be getting a 1099. So once again, this is something that we don't generally do. The IRS probably has not come and said, hey, you're in trouble. But, you know, if you ever get audited and your books are not in good order, these are the things, these are the gaps that people don't usually know about that could end up getting you in some sort of trouble. So um, we are independent contractors, but we also have a lot of independent contractors working for us. Uh, and you need to be mindful of that as you run your business, that give, get the W-9 from those people, and then you need to send them a 1099 by January 31st of the following year. So like we're in 2020, you know, your coach would work for you all year long, in January of 2021, you would should have like be a good bookkeeping, budgeting, et cetera. I paid my coach $5,000 for the year. You send off a 1099 to your coach saying that they paid, you know, you paid them $5,000 and you're all set. Um, so those are things with the W-9, the W-9 and the 1099, they kind of go hand in hand. The W-9 is to get the information. The 1099 is to report whatever information um, was actually with the, with the income included. Lauren, there's a couple of questions in the chat here. Do you want me to read oh. them? I know it's really difficult yeah. to look at it while you're screen sharing. <laughs> yes, please do. Uh, yeah, so there's one question. So if you're writing it off, you need to have a W-9 from those contractors? If you're writing it off, yeah, so exactly. You should, so like you said, if it's a massage therapist and you're saying that's a business expense for me, then you should have collected a W-9 from that massage therapist to say, um, you know, this is money I paid you. Gotcha. And people get a little weird about it. So like, don't be afraid to tell like the massage therapist, like I said, maybe, maybe three of his clients do it and the other 10 of them don't. And he's kind of gets like, uh, well, no one else ever really does not a big deal. Like they try to tell you it's not, um, you know, it's just good business practice. So like I said, will the world end? If, like I said, if you've done it already and, and not have, you know, you're still here, you're still breathing. So the world does not end, but it is good business practice and it's what's appropriate to make sure a good accounting is done. And the other question is, is there a minimum yearly revenue to make an S-Corp worthwhile? Yeah, so this is a hard one. The answer is always kind of like, it depends, but it's generally like once you hit the six-figure mark. So when you think about doing the LLC and the S-Corp, um, the LLC is, you know, depending on what state you're in, roughly around 300 bucks to set up. And then there's like an annual fee every year to keep your state registration. Um, then in addition, when you go from an LLC to, you know, deciding to be uh, taxed as an S Corp, you now have two tax returns. So like I said, independent contractor, sole proprietor, that's just an additional form on your regular tax, uh, on your regular tax return. But when you decide to become an S Corp, you now have your regular tax return and a tax return called an 1120S. So now an accountant is going to be doing two returns, which is going to cost you more money. So you need to look at the fees associated with, you know, now I have two tax returns, I have a fee every year to fill out, and then how much am I saving on taxes, you know, via the self-employment tax or other things that I can get um, to, to see if it, that is this worthwhile. So I know, like, as an example, New York and California are very expensive on an annual basis to renew your um, your business uh, accreditations. Uh, other states, it's like 30 bucks, you know, so it just kind of, it, it varies, but I'd say around the six figure mark is when you should start to look into this and, and have a conversation with your accountant. If you're working with a good accountant, they will be able to kind of map out, like, here's your, you know, here's the information you gave me. Here's what it looks like if we just put it all on your 1040 uh, as a sole proprietor, independent contractor. Here's what it looks like if we decided to tax you as an S corp. Um, and here's the difference in, you know, how much you could save or get because of that. So they can run that number before you even decide to make that election one way or the other. More questions? Nope. No, um, I think okay. you just answered it, which was like the maximum. What's the, when you should consider an S Corp, right? So I think you just answered that. <laughs> yeah, perfect. Now, my second question was when you should you consider a C Corp? Oh, uh, when you're balling. <laughs> yeah. So, <laughs> so generally the C Corps are used for, like I said, large businesses with lots of employees. Um, and, ex and expecting a significant growth. So there are some larger, like I said, so with an S-Corp, you can have up to 100 shareholders. 
Um, so that's like a hundred different people that are owners of the business in some sort, form or fashion. Um, but then you could also have employees. So without those people being share, shareholders with a C Corp, like I said, your opportunity is just a lot larger. Um, so you need to be thinking about, like I said, where am I planning to take this business for, like I said, for one person show, not worthwhile. Um, but when you're talking about having, you know, hundreds of employees and growing and, um, we're talking about going global, things like that. That's when you start looking at a C Corp. Cool. All right, on to the W-2 and W-4. Oh my goodness, those heels. Uh, <laughs> this one's coming down the <laughs> stairs. Uh, so W-2 versus W-4. Uh, when you think about W-2, it's a similar how we like in the way that we have it right above. The W-2 is what, no, it's the, actually it's the opposite way around. The W-4 is what you fill out. <laughs> have to switch that on the slide. The W-4 is what you fill out when you get the job and the W-2 is what you get at the end of the year, um, kind of documenting what you actually did while at the job. So the W-4, um, a lot of people get all worked up because they're like, I gotta figure out what my number of allowances is and what do I need to do? Good news is they no longer do allowances as of 20, it was the beginning of 2019. So um, there's still a form that you fill out and they basically ask you the questions necessary to kind of get to the number that is your allowances. So allowances are a thing of the past. Um, for those who were subject to it before, don't have to freak out anymore. If you're getting ready to get a new job, the, the form is a lot easier to fill out. But the biggest thing is understanding that um, you can decide how much you want to have taken out of your taxes uh, or out of your paycheck um, to go toward taxes. And the more that's taken out, you know, the more likely you are to probably get a return, um, but also the smaller your paycheck is going to be. So what you want to do is try to find kind of like what is the appropriate number for uh, you so that you're not having to pay Uncle Sam a whole bunch of money that you didn't plan on, but also not having to um, get so much back that you've been you know, living like a pauper all year long and now you're like dying for this tax return. Um, and then you feel really happy because you're like, oh my goodness, I got my tax return and I can pay off my debt. You know, you don't want to be in debt for 12 months when you could have just had a bigger paycheck and maybe not had, um, you know, not had that debt come about. So you want to find a good balance. The other thing too is just like reminding you that um, your tax return is not free money. A lot of people get the, the refund and they're just like, oh my goodness, like I hit the lottery. This is great. You know, that's money that you worked for and you earned all year long and you, you gave it to the IRS and they're giving you a rebate because you overgave it to them. It didn't just fall out of the sky. It's not just magical money that they're giving away to you. It, it is your money that you earned that is just being returned to you. And so just to be remind, mindful to, you know, be responsible with it, use it as it's meant to be used as income so that you can, you know, further your financial goals. <laughs> Did not plan on the heels. Um, Another question here, Lauren, <laughs> the heels and all. Um, I, I have a question about estimated payments if you remain a sole proprietor. You can wait till we get to like the, I don't know, more tax appropriate time. But I dealt with that a lot. I was like, I don't want to give the IRS like a free loan when I need that money. And I have no real way to predict my estimated payments, but I'm encouraged to do so. I just like, I hated it. It was horrible. Yeah, no, it is a tough one, especially for Olympic athletes because our income fluctuates so much. So as an example, I had a client had an awesome year and earned like $300,000. And so, you know, they, the taxes got done and the accountant provided es estimated tax um, stubs. So for the next, you know, four quarters, we were supposed to submit taxes based on this 300K and the gentleman got injured like at the beginning of the season. So there was no 300,000 going to be made that year. <laughs> we were going to be hard pressed to like have 100K. Um, and so it didn't make sense to be paying based on earning 300,000 when we knew earnings weren't going to be that high. So what we did was just like wait. And like I said, we, we, we did do taxes just based on the regular, uh, like on, on what we knew was coming in. Uh, and then looked at the tax liability and it just didn't like that. So it's just, it is, like you said, highly encouraged to do your estimated taxes, but the penalties are very small. So that's another thing is like the actual calculation for the way penalties are done as it pertains to not paying on time for the quarter. So they're due on January 15th, April 15th, September, 
I missed July it. July and October, I think. There we go. <laughs> what she said. Right. <laughs> but it doesn't go on the exact schedule. Though. It's not October. I think it's September. So it would be. Especially in 2020. So anyway. Right. Neither here nor there. They're due four times a year. <laughs> and um, what happens is if you don't pay, like you said, then there's like penalties associated with you not having paid. But these are not like. Like I said, it's not like credit card debt type penalties. This is like, you know, 50 bucks or something. And I'm not, you know, I don't say that to minimize that, you know, it's money out of your pocket, but it's that the world doesn't end. Like you, like you said, if you've given up $12,000, you know, uh, when you probably would have paid $4,000, like it's a big deal. And then you have to wait on their terms to get that money back. It totally throws off cash flow things. So it makes a lot of sense to have that money set aside on, in your account. So I usually have comp- I usually have clients do a um, like a business account, then do a business savings account and drop in the money that they feel like they should be paying toward estimated taxes. Um, and then get a good number done. Like I said, you can check in with your account and if you're working with somebody and get a projection, like can you update me based on what I've made? Like, is this too high, too low, whatever? Um, which also leads back to like I said, good accounting practices. Like if you don't know what you have to write off for the year, then it's hard for them to say like, oh yeah, you're definitely not gonna have to pay that much you know, some of that money can go into your IRA or whatever, you know, whatever you're planning on doing. So, um, yeah, the, 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 the correct question, the, the correct answer to the question is, yes, you should be paying estimated taxes, but uh, does it make the most sense for professional athletes all the time? 85% no. Um, you just need to stay mindful. Like I said, you need to be setting the money aside and then, set, you know, you can pay a little bit as you feel comfortable and be underpaid but as long as you get the last payment in and know that you're paid up in full and have the money set aside. But I'd much rather be in the possession of that money, especially with something like the pandemic that just happened. Like, mm-hmm. um, imagine really needing the cash flow and, you know, now it's being held by the IRS until you file your taxes on April of next year and get your return probably in June or July of next year. So. And I'm also hearing communicate with your financial professional. Yes. Communicate. Communication is key it is just like beyond important because if they find out at the last minute like you said they they now need to scramble to help you um which one the financial professional may be busy so may not be able to scramble um but two there's things that could be happening all year long so that there's no scramble necessary um so yeah communication is a, a key part of and just checking in with whom, whomever you're working with a couple times a year uh to make sure that you're on track for whatever it is that you're trying to accomplish All right, so then budgeting versus bookkeeping. Um, So these two things kind of get a bad rap. I like both of the the big bad B words. Um, They are different though, you know, and they seem a little bit similar, but they have two different purposes. So bookkeeping is simply staying organized for tax purposes. Um, So that is tracking your expenses. I went to, you know, the massage therapist today I just bought a plane ticket to nationals for the championships. I booked the hotel. Um, I paid my coach. All of those things are things that need to be tracked for tax purposes. Um, that tracking it is that's, that's what bookkeeping is. However, with budgeting, it's about planning ahead to be able to say, I have X number of dollars. I need X, do- X number of other dollars. Um, and this is the way that I want my money to be spent. So instead, in the same you know, scenario, making a budget for your, your sporting expenses, uh, you want to be able to say, okay, uh, the coach is $12,000 for the year, that's $1,000 a month. Even if you only pay the coach twice a year or you know, three times a year, so, you, know, so you have some sort of arrangement with the coach, you need to kind of be able to stabilize your income and you need to kind of think about what do I need for income in order to be able to cover the things in my budget. So... Um, in my example, coach is 12,000 bucks a year. Um, you know, travel is 12,000. I'm just make all the numbers round and, uh, nutrition and health is also 12,000. So we got $36,000 of expenses for the year. Uh, like I said, they're happening all over the place and sporadically, but now, you know, you have, a, you need a budget of $300, I mean, $3,000 every month in order to cover your expenses. So what you do is get, you know, a spreadsheet, notebook, app, however, and then say among these expenses, you know, if I got 3000 bucks every month, okay, I can afford to pay my coach a thousand dollars a month, or I can, you know, afford to pay da 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 
and you know nutrition is fifty dollars this month and then next month it's massage that's a hundred or whatever the case may be but budgeting is all about planning ahead for expenses so that you can kind of map things out and understand what your income need is and also what your ability to save is so i just kind of gave you the budget from a like a, a sports perspective but we need to budget on our regular expenses as well so rent food lights utilities car note student loan payments you name it um, all of those things need to be accounted for and so looking at okay here are all the things that are going to come up in this month here's the income that i'm going to earn um you know does this you know does one cover the other and if so what else what else do i need to cover so saving is one of those things and i always tell people to say pay, pay yourself first so, you know, if you got 5,000 bucks coming in and your expenses are 3,000, like right off the bat, you want to say like, well, I can save at least $1,000 for myself. Um, pay your $3,000 of expenses and then kind of reevaluate with the other thousand that's left over. What else do I need to do? So bookkeeping is simply tracking. Budgeting is planning ahead and creating a plan for yourself so that you know, one, uh, what your expenses will be to what income you need. And then three, how to be able to set goals around saving and other things that you want to accomplish. Um, and so both of them are important things if you're going to be organized. Uh, like I said, so my favorite budgeting app, actually I'll go back to that, is called You Need a Budget. And it is amazing. Everyone should try it. Um, you get 34 days free. Um, there are tons of other budgeting apps out there. There's Mint that's super popular. And it is 100% free. It doesn't work as well. So you kind of get what you pay for um and it's not that it doesn't work so if you want to you know get started on it and you never tried budgeting before it's a great place to, to try uh, but you will find that um you know as you get more into it and more interested in budgeting that you may need something a little bit more strategic or a little bit more well laid out um, but like i said there's nothing wrong with using a notebook there's nothing wrong with using a spreadsheet if you're into excel or google sheets uh, you just need a way to be able to see and understand what your expenses look like and to create a plan around your expenses and, and also, like you said, understand if there's a gap in your income. Um, so those are all things that are important as it pertains to getting organized. And the other things when we're thinking from a tax perspective about getting organized is, um, you know, receipts. So everybody always says like, well, what do I do with my receipts? How important is it for me to keep the receipts? Um, like I said, as it's written in the IRS code, you need those receipts to be able to cover your butt should you be audited. Um, you know, we are more and more living in a digital age. What people are doing is using apps to keep, you know, to capture their receipts. Um, they're just, you know, putting them all in a shoebox and scanning them all at one time into like a Google Drive or something. I mean, a Google Drive. Um, you know, there's various different ways to keep up with the information. And some people are just not keeping the receipts at all. And they're just like, you're going to use my debit or credit card statement. Get over it. Um, the, the problem with the credit or debit card statement is, like I said, is if you get audited. The, the statement is going to say Pizza Hut, $7.77. It's not going to say that, you know, it was four pizzas or, you know, two, you know, two pizzas or whatever. Um, and you don't know, was that, you know, Karen Lauren having lunch, you know, for a business purpose? Or was that, you know, a pizza you just grabbed for yourself? Um, and so that's the kind of stuff they get into when they audit, audit you, which is why the receipts are necessary. Um, so I would say, yes, it is still necessary, but there's a lot of apps that make life better for receipt keeping. Um, like you said, you can be sitting at the dinner table, take the picture of the receipt and it upload into your app and you should be good to go. Um, like I said, necessary, even kind of like drug testing is that's kind of how I think of receipts is like, we got to do it. It is what it is. We got to give our whereabouts. And um, there's, there's that one hour every day that we have to account for is there, you know, those receipts that we got to take a picture of at, at dinner or whatever the case may be. Um, and like you said, when you're doing your personal stuff, it, you know, you don't need to take a picture of that receipt. Um, if you're using a budgeting app, it's going to pull all that information in and you can say, I ate blah, blah, blah at, you know, like I just went on a trip to Detroit with my sisters and, you know, I labeled all the expenses that I had during that time birthday. So I can say exactly how much I spent on that birthday trip. Um, you know, and look at that in the future to say, okay, like that was kind of a ball and birthday. You kind of need to bring it down a notch next year, Lauren, <laughs> like, um, or whatever the case may be. So you should also be tracking your expenses for personal, but not as important from a tax perspective. Um, any questions in the chat or no? We're good. No questions. Yeah. Oh, wait. Okay. Oh yeah. No, no questions. <laughs> Comments. <laughs> <laughs> Um, 
<laughs> so then last but not least is, you know, like now that you know all of this information and you know that there's, you know, a necessity to decide, do I need to be an LLC or an S corp? Um, if I do, you know, do I make enough money to switch to one, you know, or, you know, getting that question answered, do I make enough money to switch to one? Um, I can find that W9 online, but how do I do the 1099s? I mean, it can also be done online. Uh, so the answer is yes, you can do all these things on your own, but you know, are you overwhelmed by me simply talking about them? That's a good indicator that you should probably get someone to help you. Um, you know, same thing with, like I said, the budgeting and the bookkeeping. Bookkeeping, a lot of people, you can pay a bookkeeper to do that bookkeeping for you on a monthly basis. The budgeting, like I said, I feel like you should always take responsibility for that because you need to have some awareness around your own spending. So when we think about to hire or not to hire, it is, you know, how much work am I willing to put into this to make sure that it's done right um, if I'm going to do it myself and save money versus, um, you know, is this a worthwhile cause to have a professional? You know, is it is it worth the dollars invested to probably save myself time? Um, and possibly save myself money because there's an expert looking at this and I, you know, while I learned a lot from Lauren today, I'm, I'm not an expert in this sort of thing. Uh, so you, you need to know that about yourself and know how, will, how willing you are to go into the weeds when thinking about hiring versus not hiring. I would say it's not a good idea to just not hire because you're cheap um, and you still know that you don't know this information and you're not willing to put a lot of time into it. Um, you can do your own tax returns. There's nothing wrong with it. People, you know, do it all the time. People also hire kind of other people to do their tax returns. So that's where I want to think when we talk hire or not to hire. You do not want Auntie Peaches, I'm going to say Auntie Peaches is her name today, uh, doing your taxes if Auntie Peaches just does taxes occasionally for herself and a few friends. She's not an accountant. So you do not want to pass the buck on to someone else who does not have expertise. Um, and assume that they're going to get it right for you. There are intricacies related to being a professional athlete uh, that a, just a general person is not going to be aware of. But then on top of that, like I said, because they don't have expertise in this area, they're, they're just, they're, they're more apt to make mistakes. Um, and also, if you get audited, then they can't represent you in court. So they did this tax return for you, very convenient, only cost 100 bucks or 50 bucks or something. But um, you know, when something goes wrong, it falls back on you and the burden of proof. And then you got to go hire an accountant anyway. So people who are not certified public accountants or enrolled agents, I would steer clear of. Um, and what they're generally called, if they're not one of those two things, is just like a tax preparer. Um, like I said, they do like a, maybe a general kind of like webinar course sort of thing. They get like a very quick certification. And I think, you know, now we know with all the online stuff, there's lots of things you can become certified in relatively easily uh, without a lot of education. But the enrolled agent and the certified public accountant are two people that have, um, like I said, a minimum amount of education. They have reporting requirements. They have continuing education requirements. And they, they can represent you in court should you become audited. Um, so those are the people that you want to work with. Um, they are worth the expense to, like I said, make sure your taxes are being done right, but also that, that you know, now they're taking on some liability because they have these certifications. Um, so, yeah, so when we're thinking to hire or not to hire, I would say hire, um, and then not just hire, but hire someone who is certified or an enrolled agent. And with that, I will pause and let you guys ask me questions, comments, concerns, things that I didn't cover as it pertains to taxes. Mm, all of the silence no <laughs> I think I just asked my questions during the during the thing. thing but what I was saying was that you do go big for your birthday that was the comment I, I do I do I do <laughs> I pretty much always go big for my birthday yeah. um, it's Which literally I a national holiday you. well now it's like a national day of mourning but yeah I think of it as a national holiday still yeah <laughs> um Anything else, ladies? No? You want to talk uh, investing? I, that was the other slide that we had because previously we kind of covered investing, but we just, we covered it very baseline. Um, yeah, I think, you know, one of the things I think you talked about or touched on before is like when to start investing, right? Because like looking at your debt to income ratio, for me, like mine's a little skewed because I own a property and then I also have student loans. 
Um, so I think even with those two things you should invest, but like, as far as like credit card debt, you know, what is your thought on like paying down credit card debt debt versus putting money into an investment? I am going to pull up my nifty. I actually just did a presentation on Monday for another organization. Uh, share. Cause the visual will help. Do, 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 do. Here we go. Uh, um, so, yeah, there, because you have those things does not, uh-oh, I, I pressed the play from start button, huh? Um, because you have that, those things does not prohibit you from um, investing at all. Uh, play from current side. There we go. Uh, you can invest when you have debt. You can invest when, um, you know, you have some kinds of debt. Should, should you be investing with all kinds of debt? Um, now, that is kind of open a little bit more for discussion. So this is where... I like to show my little, I got the screen in the way. There we go. Um, so if we look at this, like, what do we need to do before we're ready to invest? Or what, what should we be doing while we're investing? First things first is an emergency fund. If you don't have an emergency fund, we're not ready to invest. Uh, we need to get some money in the bank in case poop hits the fan to make sure that we're covered. Um, so, to, so if you're trying to grow money when we have no money to kind of cover anything um, is a real large liability because what happens some emergency happens and you're trying to pull the money out of the investments which means now you need to lock in losses or even lock in gains and you, you undo the investing right off the bat because the emergency is obviously the most important thing um, so you first want to get this emergency fund and i usually say that you know three months as a minimum is a good place to like once you get to the three month mark then you can kind of let off the gas so let's say uh let's say i tell you your emergency fund needs to be 30 to sixty thousand dollars you're just like, oh my goodness, I'm never gonna be able to start investing if I have to say that. Like, well, the 30 is kind of like I said, the minimum. So let's get to 30 and then maybe we can save like 500 bucks a month. You know, let's say, you know, I'm, I'm using some big baller dollars, but let's say we're saving $2,000 a month to get to the 30 and we get there really quickly. Then once we get to 30, now we like, okay, we have a significant emergency fund, but um, what do we do from there? Like we can drop down to like 500 bucks a month. So we continue to save for the emergency fund but now we can start to reallocate dollars to other places because if an emergency came, we do have something to cover us. Um, so then the next thing you see here is the company 401k. So a lot of people that work at a regular employer um, are going to have a 401k available to them. And there's what we call the employer match at most firms. So your company will match three or 4% really good companies. I've seen up to 6% of whatever you're putting in. So if you're putting in, um, you know, well, six percent of your paycheck they're also going to put in six percent of your paycheck so that's twelve percent that's being saved uh why would you want to miss out on that when that's free money being to be that you're able to take advantage of so yeah. you know i usually uh, one okay. thing i would say about this for those of you who will eventually go work for a company and they do a match just be be clear on your vested date so vested basically means like once you get to keep the match portion of your of your 401k so like i worked at adt security my vested date was three years so i made sure i stayed there at a minimum of three years to make sure i could keep all the additional money that they paid into my 401k exactly and it can go as long as five years so some of them will let you vest immediately and others will not um so like i said they'll go as far as five years so it's important to know because if it's a short-term job like it doesn't mean that you don't want to save for yourself uh, you might want to put something away for you and any dollars you put in are yours so you can take those dollars with you you just can't take the company match so let's say you get a job at a cool place and you know i'm just doing it because you know to fill the gap while i'm an, an athlete for the next couple of years is not my dream job um and there's three years to vest um then it's like well well let's think about you know maybe we should just cover the emergency fund first anyway because i know i'm only going to be at this job in two years so i'm not even going to be able to take advantage of this real employer match because i'm not going to stay there that long so get the emergency fund done and then move on to something else. And, you know, it might come into a lower priority. It's not to say you shouldn't be saving for retirement. It all depends on, like I said, what kind of things you got on your plate to tackle. But if, you, if you're not going to invest and you know you're not going to invest, then it becomes less of a priority. Generally, I tell people, like I said, is try to get to the employer match as a, as a minimum, if we can figure that out. And then whatever's coming home, 
you know, let's figure out how to save and pay down debt with those things. Now, debt, like you said, we got two, we got, we got lots of different kinds of debt, but um, when we think about debt, like student loan debt and credit card debt are kind of the main two things that I see people struggle with. Uh, the student loan debt is something that stay, hangs around long term. So we're starting to think of student loans more like a mortgage or a car where, you know, it's something that you pay off over time. Um, you know, you should get aggressive, like you said, if you have the cash flow to do it and, you know, you're going to be paying it in full. Um, but that's not one of the ones where you're like, oh, my goodness, I'm, I'm never going to be able to put money into retirement because I have student loans. Uh, you don't prioritize the student loan debt over saving at all. Credit card debt, on the other hand, is, you know, related directly to, you know, personal spending. It has a really high interest rate. Um, and so that's where, you know, like discretionary monies were spent that maybe shouldn't have been because you didn't have additional funds. Or it might have been on an emergency because you didn't have an emergency fund. You definitely want to prioritize the, the credit card debt over um, other things before, you know, because you want to get the credit card debt out of your way. Because let's say you're earning 5% in your investment account. Like your, your credit cards are at 23% every month. Like you're not breaking even to be putting money into an investment account or trying to, you know, save and make that money grow for you when you're paying such a large amount on your, on your high interest debt. So, so that's that thing to think about. And then the other thing is as athletes, we don't generally have um, 401ks available. So like I said, it depends on your earnings. Once again, if you have a nice sponsorship and you got a you know, pretty steady income that's you know, six figures above, then what we mostly talk to people about is opening a 401k or a SEP IRA. Either one of those is an um, investment account that you can open as an independent contractor, sole provider, um, as an athlete. Um, but if you can't save that much just yet, and you want to get started on saving and, you know, there's some money coming in, then this Roth IRA and traditional IRA are um, good options. And these numbers are old. So they're actually are able to put up to $6,000 away into your Roth or your traditional IRA. Um, you can't do 6,000 into each. So you can do like 3,000 in a Roth and 3,000 in a traditional or 6,000 into one or the other. Um, but it's not 12,000 total. So if there's no company 401k, then I would work on either the Roth or the traditional IRA um, and try to get to your $6,000 mark, which is roughly 500 bucks a month. So once again, what do we need to do? We need to circle back to our budget, um, you know, look at what your income is. So income is, I guess I like round numbers, $10,000 a month times three, we need a $30,000 emergency fund. So when you're looking at your budget, when you hang up, is it yes or no, three times my income? Do I have that saved somewhere? If the answer is no, I need to build my emergency fund before I think about investing. Um, you know, do I have a 401k? Can I do the employer match? Uh, does my employer have a match? Yes or no? Um, if it's, like you said, if it's not going to be invested and you know you're leaving, then we're not so worried about that. Um, then we also need to focus on our, our debt as well. So it's like, okay, okay, employer match, yay, maybe or maybe not. If they do have an employer match, I would say take advantage of it. Because if you can put 3% of your money away and they put 3% away for you, we can still work on building the emergency fund and we can still work on paying down debt with whatever else is coming home. Um, if there's no 401k, then look at, like I said, okay, I've looked at my budget. I got X number of dollars every month. Um, I have the ability to save $1,000 every month. Well, with the Roth IRA or traditional IRA, the most you can put in is like 500 bucks every month. I mean, you can put in $1,000, but once you get to 6,000, you're going to be done. So if you just did your budget and you can tell for sure I can save $1,000 every month, then the Roth IRA, the traditional IRA is not going to be appropriate for you because you need a bigger vehicle. And that's when you should look into the SEP IRA or the solo 401k. Um, and so then the other thing to point out is we talked about the employer match, but that's not going to be enough to get you to retirement. That's enough to get you started. So you're doing something like Lauren was saying, like, you know, can I invest while I'm doing these things? The answer is yes. Put some money into your 401k because that is money that's invested. If it's free money, not being left on the table, but uh, 3% is not actually going to be enough to get you to retirement. The maximum you can put into the 401k is 19,500. And so these numbers are old. Um, so you're down here where you see it at 18,000, 19,500 is how much you can put in there. So before I start talking about Robin Hood and Acorns and I don't know, brokerage accounts and all these commercials that you see, are you using the vehicles that are easiest um, and are easily available to you, which is generally that 401k? And am I doing everything I can to get myself ready for retirement? 
if I can't save $19,500 per year, I don't need an additional account to invest in. Um, if I can't save $6,000 per year, like I don't need an additional account beyond either the Roth or the traditional IRA. So simplify your life um, by choosing one of those things additionally and sticking to that. And then once you maximize that, move on to the next thing. Um, and so then, like I said, if once you're above and beyond that, so we're making $200,000 a year, we got a great budget, life is going awesome. I'm speaking into existence for all of y'all next year, right? <laughs> or 2022, if you're a Winter Olympian. Um, yes. Um, so we're getting nice fat salaries coming in and uh, we can max out. We put the 19,000 in our 401k. We did a backdoor Roth. We did 6,000 there. We're debt free. We got our emergency fund. Now we can talk about opening yet another account, which people call the brokerage account. Um, and that's where you can put additional dollars away for, um, you know, investing for your long-term future or people start wanting to look into other alternative types of investing. questions comments concerns there's a couple of questions actually in the chat as well i'm not sure um it goes to to this particular slide but um okay. do you want me to read them to you or i yes, know we've i can four minutes. <laughs> okay yeah. so yeah you kind of touch on this but would you say budgeting tracking with bookkeeper and taxes with cpa what should be more bookkeeper tasks for cpa and should i meet with them quarterly or once a year yeah, so your CPA is, most CPAs will offer bookkeeping in-house um, so that their firm, like, will, they'll have, like, an assistant that does the bookkeeping. The CPA themselves is not going to, you know, probably do bookkeeping, but it's generally a service offered, you know, all under one roof, so you can take advantage of that. Um, however, you can use an outside bookkeeping service. So, like I said, a lot of people use just kind of you know, a local bookkeeper or something like that. There's, you know, Google, you know, zip code and your bookkeeper and you can find that. It's not, you know, it's not the toughest accounting practice. It's just something like they need to be well-versed in. Uh, and bookkeeping specific to whatever your profession is. So bookkeeping to athletes, are they going to know and understand? How much training are you going to have to do to let them know? Like there's massage, there's nutrition, there's, you know, travel for this or whatever. Um, but once they get rolling, they should be good. So you can use a separate bookkeeper or you can use your accountant as a bookkeeper, um, they probably have it as an additional add-on service. Um, and then a number of times that you should meet with them, the bookkeeper probably will give you a call or email every month just to kind of like summarize, like, did I get this all right? And ask you to look over things to make sure it's all good to go. Um, and it should be like quick, like a, you know, like a 10 minute, like, or even, like I said, a lot of them just do email now and you look over and they say approved sort of deal. Um, as for the accountant, it, like I said, just depends on how complicated your situation is. For athletes, I usually recommend, um, you know, probably into the season. So in track and field, it's like, you know, October-ish. That way they can run a projection because there's no more money coming in for the year. So they already can pretty much tell like how much money you made, how much tax you're going to have to pay, et cetera. You can get that sent in. Um, Make sure your tax liability is done if you didn't do estimated taxes, Kara. Um, and then, you know, they'll check in again with you. Like, so they should be ahead of the ball for you and taxes should be really easy when we get to tax season. Um, your actual return being filed by April 15th or um, March 15th, if you're an S Corp, is an important um, thing to be mindful of. But meeting with them kind of January, February is to make sure everything is wrapped up and that whatever you talked about in October is a, a good idea as well. And then, like I said, maybe one other time in the middle of the year, like at the most three times a year, I don't think you really need to meet with them three times a year. It depends on like you said, what your season looks like and if things are changing. If they're fluctuating quite a bit, then you can say, I need a projection. Um, but generally, I think just meeting with them tw twice a year would be uh, good for an accountant. And there was one more question um, in the chat as well. Uh, I have an LLC, but it's for investment properties um, that I plan on buying within the next 12 months. I'm the only member. I have a DUNS number and an EIN. How can I get secured lines of credit or find merchant lines of credit for my LLC so that I can look better for lenders without taking on too much more debt? Yeah, so a, a line of credit is specific, like, you know, if you want to buy real estate, then, you know, you would get a mortgage or for, for that particular property. The line of credit would be something that you would use to help um, you know, get yourself, like get things, if, if you wanted to flip the house as an example. So you'd use a line of credit for that. So one thing is that you're going to have to have good credit because they're not going to like, you're not going to have any credit established for the LLC. LLC. 
Um, so that's one thing to take into consideration. Um, and then like where to go for the lines of credit, like I would go to the mortgage broker first and then they could probably refer you to where you could get an additional line of credit, um, like where good lenders are. The biggest thing to know too is that like when you start looking, um, you have 45 day window from when your credit is pulled to go to multiple different lenders. So one thing a lot of people worry about is, you know, they're gonna pull my credit, my credit's gonna go down and it's gonna ruin everything. Um, you can get your credit cooled 100 times in that 45 day window. Um, and it doesn't, you just get that one hit on your credit. The other thing too is like once it's all said and done is that your credit goes right back up. So you might drop like 10 points because it, it was hit. Um, but barring anything happening, like you missing payments or anything like that, the, 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 the credit goes back to where it was. So um, bye, Kara. Um, does that answer the question or no? I feel like this was Lauren's question probably. No, was it? <laughs> um, so yeah, so that's the biggest thing. And then, I mean, they, it's set up in an LLC, but um, the other thing is it's generally kind of hard to get loans in the name of an LLC or to switch like, um, so you might buy a house in your name and then you try to put the house into the LLC. Um, when it has a lender, the lender will make it the whole mortgage come due to get it to change over deed wise. So you want to buy the house in the name of the LLC. Um, which is also, like I said, not the easiest thing to do. So you, you want to just be mindful of that as well. Awesome. Thank you so much, Lauren. We used every minute of this presentation in this hour. So thank you so much information. And uh, we probably could stay on and pick your brain for another hour or so, but right. we'll let you go for now. We'll let you go for now. Thank you for joining our parody community. Thank you for being here. Um, and yeah, if there are no other questions, we'll leave. We'll see you kind of next week when we bring on Gia Goodrich. <laughs> All right. Bye, everyone. Thank you.